as a way to help you this morning, uh, when you leave, we'll have these available out in the, the lobby if you'd like to pick up one of those. Great deterrent. Yeah, we're talking about gratitude, and um, last week we talked about a passage that Jesus talked about in Luke 17, about ten lepers who went to Jesus and he cleansed them all, healed them immediately. I mean, they had a death sentence and he gave them life and healed them and they took off and it said one of them came back and said, thank you, thank you for healing me. And and what we discovered was that it was was amazing is that God noticed the one with the grateful heart, he noticed him, but he also noticed the other nine who didn't have gratitude because he said, where are the... Didn't I heal ten and only one comes back? Where are the other nine? So we've talked about gratitude and the role of gratitude, what we basically said last week was the role of gratitude was to lift our eyes off the things that we lack so we might see the blessings we possess. Just refocus us. When we have gratitude, it refocuses off the problems and puts it on the solution or what we, we do have. And here's the thing, gratitude is not a feeling, Okay. It's not something, well, I just don't feel very grateful. Well, there's a lot of days I get up and I don't feel grateful because gratitude is not a feeling. Gratitude is a choice that we make. It's a decision. It has nothing to do with feeling. Sometimes they're there, sometimes they're not. But gratitude is a decision or a choice that we make. And last week we talked about how can we live every day of our life with gratitude? How can we do that? And I just gave you a couple of things if you were here last week. You remember, but one of them was this, is that we learned to major in the grace of God. Major in the grace of God. We, we set our focus on the cross. We linger at the foot of the cross. We, we, we reacquaint ourselves with the grace of God and the love of God. In Ephesians, Paul he said, it's only by God's grace that you've been saved. God saved you by His grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. And he said, focus on that gift. Focus on the grace of God. And the second thing we talked about, if we're going to live every day with gratitude, is to count the gifts. Okay, Count the blessings of God. Count the good things of God. It categorizes kindness in our life. And recall all the reasons that we have to be grateful and recite them. And I hope you took the challenge last week of the journal. Did you do that? To get a journal and for seven days, just start the day every day or end the day with For these things, I'm grateful. Or thank you, God, for for these things in my life. I've talked to so many this week that they have said, hey, we're doing that, or we've done that, or or we're in the process of doing that. I actually had somebody that brought me a journal Sunday afternoon, and they said, here, we bought journals, and here's you a journal. And and, and just listing and recalling the goodness and the gifts of God, regardless of our circumstances, regardless of what's going on in our lives, we can be thankful We can have gratitude in the midst of chaos in our life. And the reason we can do that is because of the goodness of God is because what's inside of us does not have to reflect what's on the outside of us. What's inside us doesn't have to reflect what's on the outside of us. So today, buckle up. Are you a griper or are you grateful? Griping are grateful. Read a story of a monk, a young man, he wanted to be a monk, and he went to a monastery, and when he got there, he took the vow of silence for the year, that he would not say a word for a year. So he goes through this entire year not saying a single word in silence, and, and he gets to the end of the year, and he comes before the head of the monastery, and he says, congratulations, son, you made your first year of silence, your vow of silence. He said, you get to say two words, what would you like to say? And he said, bed hard. Okay, so he starts his second year, a vow of silence. And he goes an entire second year and doesn't say a word. And he comes in at the end of the two years and stands before the head of the the monastery. And he says, congratulations, you've made it two years. He said, so what's the good word? What's What's your two words? And he said, food bad. He said, okay, so he goes another year, third year, taking a vow of silence. And he comes in the end of the third year, and he stands before the head of the monastery, and he, he says, son, congratulations, you've gone three years. That's quite an accomplishment. And, 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 I'm proud of you. He said, what do you have to say? What's your two words? And he said, 
I quit. I quit. And the head of the monastery stood back and he said, well, I'm not surprised. All you've done is complain since you've been here. Griping or gratitude? You see, griping is a gratitude killer. It makes everyone unhappy around us. It makes us unhappy. And the problem is, it's a habit, okay? It, it's a habit, and habits are hard to break. The only way you can break a habit is to replace it with something better or something positive. And we tend to, to look at bad things. We tend to look at bad things in life, and, and, and we're conditioned by that in society, aren't we? I mean, we, we're always, we don't never hardly go around talking about, well, let me tell you the good news. It's always, well, let me tell you what's happened. Let me tell you about the bad. Let me tell you what I saw. Let me tell you what I heard. Bad news makes the headlines. Rarely does... Good news make the headlines. Gossip is relished because of it. We want to hear, what's the, what did you hear? Well, let me hear. Yeah, and we, we pass that along. Bad news. Bad things. We're conditioned to that. But the Scripture states this, that God wants Christ followers to be different. God wants Christ followers to be different. And, and we're going to find this. We're going to look at Philippians chapter 2 and verse 14, and we're going to see just how different he wants us to be. And here it is. You, you buckled up. You ready? P punch the person next to you. Say, wake up. He just asked a question. Are you ready? Here we go. Do everything without complaining or arguing. That's not in the Bible, really, is it? No, it is. Do what? Do everything without what? Complaining and arguing. We're just going to stop right there for a minute, and we're going to look at this. Do everything without complaining and without arguing. You know, I think generally there's, there's probably about four types of complainers or gripers in life, and the first one is whiners. Okay, now don't punch anybody when I go through these, but, but there's the whiners. Those are the people that wake up negative. Those are the people, their philosophy is rise and whine, you know, every day. That's that type of person. David was actually a whiner. Did, I mean, he's, he was a man after God's own heart. He wrote a lot of great songs and psalms and, and did a lot of that. But he was a whiner. He was a whiner. We read in, in Psalm 73, he, he said, did I keep my heart pure for nothing? Did I keep myself innocent for, for no reason? I get nothing but trouble all day long. Every morning brings me pain. Whine, whine, whine. A telltale sign of a whiner is they make statements like this. Life's not fair. I don't deserve this. Everybody else gets all the breaks. I don't ever get a break. Let me just tell you this. Fairness ended in the Garden of Eden. Fairness ended in the Garden of Eden. And since then, life is not fair. In fact, God never promised anywhere in Scripture did He say life was going to be fair. Why? Because we live in a sin-tainted, fallen world since the Garden of Eden. So life's not fair. No need in whining about it. Second one is the martyr. The martyr. And the martyr's favorite phrase is this, well, no one appreciates me. No one appreciates me. They're good party planners. They always throw pity parties. I mean, they've always got something going on. In fact, Moses, here's another great man of God. But he was a, a martyr because he was always complaining to God. It, Moses said to the Lord, why are you treating me, this, your servant, so harshly? Have mercy on me. What did I do to deserve the burden of all these people you've put me over? I can't carry all these people by myself. The load is too heavy. And if, it, if this is how you intend to treat me, then just go ahead and kill me. Wow. Do me a favor and spare me this misery. You know, the, the martyrs, when they're sick or when they're under pressure or when they feel underappreciated, that's when they want everybody to know about it. The martyr. The third one is the, the cynic. Cynic. Their favorite pre phrase is this, nothing will ever change. Nothing's ever going to change. Always going to be the same. Solomon was kind of that way, and he wrote these words. He said, everything's meaningless completely meaningless. What do, what do people get for all their hard work and, and labor under the sun? Generations come, generations go, but the earth never changes. History merely repeats itself. It has all been done before. Nothing under the sun is truly new. The cynic, the critical. 
And then the fourth one is the perfectionist. The perfectionist, and their phrase is always, is that the best you can do, or, or that's not good enough. Nothing's ever right for this person. Nothing's ever good enough for this person. In fact, Proverbs, he, he, a couple of scriptures out of Proverbs, he said one is, a complaining wife is like a water that never stops dripping on a rainy day. Hold on. Another one says, it's better out in the desert than at home with a nagging, complaining wife. Now let me just stop right here and say, guys, before you go welding that scripture home and throwing that around at your wife, let me just emphasize that this could go either way. Okay? It could read a complaining husband is like water that never stops dripping on a rainy day. Or it is better to be out in the desert than at home with a complaining, nagging husband. A perfectionist, always arguing, never right, never good enough. You say, well, why are you covering all this? Well, let me explain. Nothing destroys the warmth of a home faster than complaining and griping. Nothing will destroy the harmony of a ministry team or a work group or a sports team or, or anything else. Nothing destroys it faster than complaining and griping. If your kids or your volunteers or your co-workers, if you, uh, the company you work at, or, or if you find them complaining all the time, a good question to ask yourself is, am I setting an example for this? And have you noticed that gripers attract each other? You get one in a crowd that's griping and complaining, pretty soon there's two. And pretty soon there's another, there's a third, and they just kind of gravitate together. But let a grateful person come into that group, somebody that comes in and goes, oh yeah, that's bad, but let me tell you about what, what's so good. Let me tell you about what God's done. Let me tell you about what, what's happened. You let somebody that's not a griper come into that group, and that conversation quickly comes to an end, or those people quickly find other places to go because the two don't mix. So what I want to do this morning is I want to talk about how do we move from griping to gratitude? How do we move from what is normally a default for us is we complain about every, the weather, we complain about football, we complain about food, we complain about service, we, all these things. How do we move from a default griping mode to a gratitude mode? I want to give you just a few things. And the first one starts with this. Well, I think I jumped too fast. Well, we'll just go on. Forget it. The first one is this. Admit there's a problem. Admit there's a problem. Usually gripers, complainers, it's ever, you know, they're, they're looking at everybody, they never look at themselves. Admit it's a problem for you, not for others, but it's for you. And the scripture says, it's Proverbs 28 and 13, it says, a man who refuses to admit his mistakes can never be successful. But if he confesses and forsakes them, he gets another chance. Often the most difficult part of learning to handle complaining and, is to recognize it in yourself. Am I a complainer? If someone were to record your words over the last week, your conversations, what would it reveal about you? If somebody was following you around, getting every word that you said over this past week, what would that reveal about you? How much time do we spend grumbling, complaining, and griping about stuff? Here's a test. Here's a good way to, to take care of this first one. Is go to a trusted friend and ask them, say, Am, do I tend to be more of a complainer or griper, or am I more grateful and have gratitude? Go to a trusted friend and, and listen to what they have to say. Better yet, why don't you ask your spouse, do I tend to gripe and complain more, or am I more grateful? And then if you want the gut honest, bare street level, honest to God answer, go to your kids. And say, son, daughter, am I more of a complainer and griper or am I grateful? And then just listen to what they have to say. You see, here's the thing. Complaining isn't just a bad habit. It's a sin, okay? It's a sin and we need to admit it. It was the same sin that caused the, the Israelites to be left out of the promised land because of their griping and complaining 
all the time to God. He would do incredible things for them, and then they'd turn right around and start complaining and griping again, saying, well, you don't do this, and whine, 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 and critical. And finally, it kept them from getting God's best in their life because of their complaining. So the first thing, admit it's a problem. Admit it's a problem. Second thing is accept responsibility for my own life. Accept the responsibility for my own life. Many times complaining is just an attempt to blame other people for problems that I created. Ooh. It's an attitude shift, a focus from someone else. They did it, it's their fault, passing the buck. It's not my responsibility. When I bring problems into my life, I have no legitimate right to complain. Oftentimes, it's just an excuse to be irresponsible, not accept the fact that I have caused this situation. We reap what we sow, and then when we do, we have no legitimate right to complain about the results. We reap what we sow. Here's the deal. God has given all of us freedom of choice, and that's wonderful. I am so thankful God gave us Freedom of choice. We're not robots. We're not down here and we, we're just little minions and he's moving us around and, and, and just doing what he wants to. With us. But he gave us, every single one of us, he gave us freedom of choice. We're free to choose, but we are never free from the consequences of our choices. Yeah, you can choose. You can choose to be a griper or you can choose to be grateful. But you're never free from the consequences of those choices. For example, people complain, well, I'm in debt. I just, I can't get out of debt. I'm in debt up to my eyeball. Is it possible that maybe we were irresponsible in spending or charging or not saving or handling our resources as God instructed us to handle them? Well, I'm not appreciated at home or I'm not appreciated on the job. Could it be possible that we're not appreciating others? around us at home or on the job. Well, I don't have any friends. I just don't, nobody like, I don't have any friends. Is it possible that the scripture says that he who has friends must show himself friendly? Well, I'm just not having my needs met in my marriage. Well, are we putting the needs of our spouse ahead of our needs? We have to accept the responsibility for the choices that we make. So there's three types of people in life. There's accusers, there's excusers, and there's choosers. And the accusers, they're always going around saying, it's your fault. It's, you're to blame. It's, it's, you're the reason. You're why. They're blaming everyone. When Adam sinned, what did he do? He pointed at his wife. He said, it's Eve. It's her fault. And if that wasn't good enough, he finally pointed at God. And he said, no, it's your fault, God, because you created Eve and gave her to me. Accusers. And then there's excusers. People who say, well, I'm just a product of my environment. It's really not my fault. I can't help the circumstances. of my, I had bad parents, or I had bad boss, or I had a bad coach, or teacher, or, or the government's bad, or and we were just blaming and we're finding excuses. The successful people are choosers. Choosers, they accept responsibility for their own decisions. Third thing, if we're going to move from griping to gratitude, is we have to choose. We have to choose the attitude of gratitude. It's a choice we make. The scripture of 1 Thessalonians 5.18, he says, give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. You want to know what God's will for your life is? Here's one thing you can just take to the bank and say, well, I can do that. God said, it's my will that you give thanks, that you show gratitude in all circumstances circumstances. You can't always be thankful for the circumstances, but he said you can always be thankful in the circumstances. How do we do that? Because we know that God says, I will work in all things for the good of those who love me and are called according to my purpose. My life is greater than my problems, so I give thanks in every thing that comes into my life. When I choose gratitude and learn to be grateful for what I have, there's a, a tremendous deterrent to complaining when we start counting and recording our blessings. We can choose to focus on the negative, the, pot, the old, old deal, the glass is half full or the glass is 
half empty. It's according to how you look at it. Yeah, bad things will happen. And there'll be things we don't like about our marriage. There'll be things we don't like about our business. There'll be things we don't like about our school. There'll be things we don't even like about ourselves. But I also believe that we, if we look hard enough, we can find things to be grateful for and positive about in our life. I, I love a story of Viktor Frankl. I, I've shared before, but he was a survivor of the German Holocaust. He was thrown into a Nazi concentration camp. His family was killed. They stripped him of everything he had. Every physical possession that he had, they took from him. They took the clothes off of it. Every stitch of clothes that he had, they took his clothes. They beat him. They tortured him. And as he stood before his accusers, he said it finally dawned on him that they had taken everything that he had in life, everything that he valued, they had taken from him. And as he stood there before his accusers, he said it dawned on him, there's one thing that they can never take away from me. And that is my ability to choose my attitude and my response. I'm not controlled by my circumstances around me. I have a choice. Fourth thing is look for God's hand in circumstances. Look for God's hand in circumstances. If you want to get victory over griping and complaining, look for God's hand in your circumstances. Uh, Paul talks about it, 2 Corinthians. He said, And this small and temporary trouble that we suffer will bring us a tremendous and eternal glory, much greater than the trouble. For we fix our attention not on the things that are seen, but on the things that are unseen. Because what we see, what can be seen only lasts for time, but what we cannot see lasts forever. Paul is saying problems will come into your life, but it will be the way that you look at them that determines whether you'll be grateful or whether you'll gripe. It's the reason we're told over and over in the Bible not to complain. He said, don't complain. Because complaining is, is literally, you, I said earlier, it's a sin. Here's the sin. Complaining is literally rebelling against God. When I'm complaining about circumstances that are beyond my control, I'm basically, and, and really saying, if I were God, things would be different. If I was God, I could handle this so much better. And, and we're complaining. Listen, when we're complaining about circumstances beyond our control, we're basically complaining and challenging three different things. We're, we're questioning God's wisdom. We're saying, do you really know what you're doing, God? Do you really think this is best? Do you really have a plan? Do you really even know what's going on? We're questioning God's wisdom. We're, we're doubting God's care. Well, do you really love me? If you're allowing this to happen, do you really love me? Do you really care about me? And third is, is that we're forgetting God's goodness. Forgetting God. We're focusing on what we don't have rather than what we do have. We're being ungrateful. And I don't know about you, but here's what I've discovered. Is oftentimes, the things I personally complain about the most are the very things that God knows I need the most in my life to become what He wants me to be. I want to say that again because I want that to really sink in. The things that I complain about the most sometimes are the very things that God says, this is what you need in your life to become the person that I want you to be. And then the last thing, the fifth thing is this. Practice speaking positively. Complaining's a habit, and habits are replaced by other things. Replacing complaining and negative in our life with speaking positive. Paul talks about it in Ephesians 4. He said, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building up others according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Let me ask you a question. How do you leave people after you have conversation with them? How do we leave them? Do you find people are avoiding you or people want to keep short conversations with you? It may be a clue that you might want to listen to what you're saying. 
Are you being critical of others? Are you being critical of the government? Are you being critical of sports? Or critical of the current news? Or even critical of church? I have to limit my time around negative people because they drain me. And if I'm listening to negative all the time, it, it takes an effect on me. So practice speaking positively. You say, well, why, why all this? Why, why, why do we need to do this? Well, here's the results. The results of being grateful over griping. And we go back to the passage we started with in Philippians 2. He said, do everything without complaining and arguing. Here's the reason. So that you will be blameless and pure and children of God without fault. He goes on, he says, but you are living with evil people all around you who've lost their sense of what is right. Among those people, you shine like lights in a dark world. Why do we need to be grateful people? Why does God say, I want my followers to be different? I want them to be grateful people. He said, first of all, so we can be blameless. Nobody can point a finger at us and nobody can point fault with us. It's not to say, hey, we're perfect. We don't ever do anything. But no one can say, hey, they are so critical. They are so negative. Oh, they're always bowed mathing people. Oh, they're always finding fault in everyone and in everything. He said, be grateful so that you can be blameless. Be grateful so that you can be pure. Non-gossipers and gripers are usually people of integrity. And then the last one, I love this, he said, so that you can be children of God. So that you can be children of God who shine like stars in the universe. And that's, that's it right there. Our culture is so negative today. When you find a person who's genuinely positive, they, they tend to stick out. They contrast with others. And when you choose not to complain, not to be critical, not to put others down, he said, you stand out. You shine like stars in a dark world. Because here's the point of the whole passage. Here's the point of the whole message. A griping Christ follower is a bad witness. It's a bad witness. Because we're bombarded every day with negative. We're bombarded at work, at school, in the news, in the government. I've heard Christians grumble and complain and be critical of each other and of the government, of politics and bosses, and, and the list goes on. And the very people, the very people who should be the most grateful are often the most critical. Listen, complainers repel the grateful attract. Want to change the atmosphere in your marriage? Try gratitude. You want to change the atmosphere in your home with your kids? Try gratitude. You want to change the atmosphere where you work? You go, well, you don't know the people I work with. You don't know all that. You want to change the atmosphere where you work? Try gratitude. You want to change the atmosphere of your school, your classroom, your sports team? Try gratitude. Quit griping and become grateful. And the thing is, we can start this today. This is something every single one of us can do when we walk out of here today. Is make a choice, not a feeling, but make a choice that, hey, I will walk out and I will be grateful. Fan's going to come and get ready.